Hello and welcome to The Daily Space for today, Thursday, April 9th, 2019. I am your host, Dr. Pamela Gay, and I am here to put science in your brain. Now, I want to warn you right here at the top of the show that we record this live, which means those of you watching on YouTube, sometimes you get to see a little less production value than we would like. Um, Earlier today, I rebooted my computer and Apple decided to install updates. And I'm not quite sure what went sideways, but... My production software lost track of where all of its files are stored on the hard drive. So I think I have everything fixed, but if at some point during the show the audio goes away, a video doesn't appear as expected, I would request your patience. Going out live is oh so very much fun. And one of the things I and many, many other podcasters and YouTubers are enjoying right now is watching all the people on prime time who are used to having a cast of many produce them, struggling to put out content that, frankly, you guys wouldn't accept from those of us here on, well, the streaming platforms. So thank you for your patience today. I do come with a lot of science, and oh my goodness, yesterday the science flowed. After weeks of drought, of having to dig to find content, yesterday I got flooded with press releases and news articles and things that it's going to take me a few days to process. Um, If you heard the news of how the universe may be expanding at different rates in different places, yeah, I saw that one too. It's going to take me a little bit to read the article and process it, and we're going to try and get some of the scientists from that story here on twitch.tv for an interview, because there's some questions I just don't think I can field on my own. For now, though, um, I think we have some pretty awesome news for you today. And um, it just doesn't require the adding of relativistic complexities. So in our first story, uh, scientists using the Meerkat radio array in South Africa have turned up details that no one could have predicted in radio galaxies. In particular, this array, which is providing us higher resolution images than we've ever had at these particular frequencies in the sky. They are finding between the lobes in a radio galaxy, strange connecting material. This image in the very center of these two orangey blobs, you can see a little tiny circle That little tiny circle in the very center, that little tiny circle is where the optical galaxy would be located. It's actually smaller than the entirety of that circle. And what's happening is deep in the heart of a galaxy, there is an accretion disk that is feeding the supermassive black hole. And as that material rotates at extremely fast rates as it is heated up, as charge is produced, this rotating charged field generates a massive magnetic field that apparently we had underestimated the powers of in the past. This magnetic field accelerates material out the magnetic poles, creating these jets. Now the galaxy is moving through space, there is stuff around it, and this combination of movement and stuff leads to the jets not being perfectly straight and ending up with these lobes at the end where the jets are interacting with the intergalactic material. All of that we've known for a while. That's like some of the stuff I worked on studying as part of my doctoral dissertation back in the Stone Ages. Now, that's where we thought the story ended. But every time you build new telescopes with new sensitivities and you can see the universe in a new way, you find stuff you didn't even know you needed to be looking for. And in this case, in this image, um, published in Astronomy and Astrophysics with lead author Mapti Ramatasotku of Rhodes University. They have found what appear to be streamers or tubes or lines, pick your adjective, of material connecting these lobes. 
It's believed that this is caused by synchrotron radiation. This is accelerated uh, electrons that as they spiral are radiating away energy that we see with radio telescopes. And the implication of this is there may be magnetic field lines somehow connecting these lobes. This is new. This is exciting. This is pretty. And it's weird. And I think it's going to take us a while to get a completely coherent understanding of what's going on. We're going to need to rebuild computer models from scratch to add in, well, the kinds of physics that we're seeing at play here. Now, what's particularly exciting is Meerkat, while being the most sensitive thing we've got right now, it's just a precursor to the square kilometer array that's coming in the future. The Square Kilometer Array is a massive new set of telescopes that are being built with one set of frequencies being studied from Australia and another set of frequencies being study studied from Southern Africa, with the array of telescopes all built in consistent manners for each continent. And in Southern Africa, I say Southern Africa instead of South Africa, because this telescope array is so big, it spans multiple countries. That future telescope, currently under development, is going to allow us to see even finer resolutions than what we're seeing here. So we may just be starting to see the very beginnings of a remarkably detailed future of how electrons are decelerating and interacting in these complex high energy systems with magnetic fields that apparently our imaginations hadn't allowed us to fully understand. And this is really the kind of day where we're getting um, all sorts of super cool images and information coming to us from a variety of different, well, not as pretty wavelengths to our eyeballs because, well, these wavelengths are invisible to our eyeballs. In this particular image that is coming to us from um, researchers at Clemson University, uh, folks are looking at two colliding jets. And as they look, not two colliding jets, sorry, they're looking at two colliding galaxies. And as they do, what they're finding is deep in the heart, looking in gamma ray radiation. So this is like the radiation that just gives you cancer, bypass, go get cancer. Um, in this particular color, um, they're finding deep in the heart of these colliding galaxies that one of the galaxies is just starting to form jets. Now, one of the models that we've been working with throughout, well, the past several decades is when galaxies collide, it can trigger a motion of material towards the centers of the individual galaxies. This triggers star formation as clouds of gas collide and collapse. And this triggers the formation of that accretion disk of material trying to fall into the supermassive black hole in the center of the individual systems, but that material can't just fall straight in. It has to, well, dump momentum along the way, and it does that in the accretion disk. The model was you have this process starting, and once that accretion disk gets big enough, once the magnetic field and the energies get high enough, a jet turns on. And these researchers at Clemson have just, well, they think, caught a pair of galaxies in the act, confirming our models that were based on pictures of, well, right before this moment in galaxy collision with other systems. And from looking at more advanced systems, well, now we have that middle frame that was previously missing. Um, think of it this way. Imagine trying to understand human development by going to a crowded shopping mall. Um, you'll be able to catch snapshots of humans in almost every stage of their aging if you sit there long enough and look hard enough, but you probably won't be able to see one human evolve because that's just longer than you can sit. But by looking at each individual human passing by, you can catch each of the different stages. This is what we do with the universe. 
We look around, we see this galaxy is doing that, this one over here is doing this other thing. And the more we look and the more examples we study in detail, the more frames of the movie of galaxy evolution we're able to capture. Now, while galaxy evolution is something that we can't watch in real time, um, right now comets are letting us evolve, watch them evolve more than we would like. Um, earlier this week, we announced that Comet Borisov, the interstellar invader, had broken up, it appeared, as it passed the sun. Well, now it appears that Comet Atlas, our great hope for a naked eye comet, appears to have also broken up. Here we have a tweet from Carl Battams um, of Sun Grazer Comets saying, so you know how I was saying earlier that Atlas might be okay? Referring to the fact that several days ago, the core was seen to do an outburst. He went on to say, well, as long as the nucleus is intact. Well, an elongated nucleus isn't a great sign. What they're finding as they do detailed observations is the core of Comet Atlas seems to no longer be a nice friendly point source, which implies that the prior large chunk that was a core has broken apart into multiple pieces that may be drifting apart. So the comet visible to the unaided eye that I told you last week might reach somewhere between like two and minus six in brightness. No, sorry, I have to take that one back. Comets give and comets take away and mostly they just take away. But in other news of things that haven't broken apart, I'd like to remind you that the Bepi Colombo mission, which is continuing its super long journey to Mercury, is on April 10th. That is tomorrow night. <coughs> Sorry, that's that allergies, allergies, no worries. Mm -hmm. It's safe out there. Um, Bepi Colombo is on April 10th going to do a flyby visible to those of you who have darkness at the same time as Europe. So we're looking at Europe, uh, parts of Africa, Mediterranean area. Um, if you are in equatorial regions, um, basically southern Europe, um, southward, uh, and you have a telescope that can track fast. I know there's a lot of caveats on this. Um, this little spacecraft is, is going to get closer to the planet Earth than the geosynchronous satellites as it flies past us and gets a gravitational boost and gets its orbit bent. Um, these kinds of trajectories allow spacecraft to not have to carry as much fuel with them. They basically slingshot around our solar system, gaining or losing velocity as needed and changing their tra trajectory as needed using the gravity of Earth, Venus, eventually working in this mission's case all the way down to reach Mercury. Getting to Mercury is tricky because you're dealing with the sun. Um, but by 2025, it is hoped that we are going to have a third mission reach this innermost planet. And this mission actually carries two separate spacecraft that will um, be deployed separately once it gets there. So this is one we're all looking forward to. And as a reminder that, well, space exploration is all about delayed gratification, they named this mission in 1999. People have been working on this mission since 1999. It's not getting to Mercury until 2025. That's an entire generation coming into existence during the construction, formulation, launch, and travel period of this mission before any science can be done. But once it gets there, hopefully it'll be worth it. Now, that is all the science I have for today, but that's not all I have for today. 
as promised, we are going to be joined by Greg Gabor, um, whose last name I'm sure I have mangled once again, because that's what I do. Uh, before I bring him on, I'm going to try and throw up the uh, rocket video momentarily to just get my screen sorted. And then we're going to talk gravity, cats, and the intersection thereof. So don't go anywhere, anyone. I am going to be right back, and the science shall continue to flow. Please stand by. Hello, everyone. We are back, and I'm just realizing. Um, can you say something over? I want to make sure that they can hear you. Yep, um, testing right now. Yes, they can hear you. It is glorious. I did not screw anything up. Um, so thank you so much for your patience today as I continue to triple check and quadruple check that all the software is working again. Um, it's been a crazy day of um, sometimes installing your technical updates is one heck of a mistake that you pay for the entire day. Now, um, I brought you on for a lot of reasons, one being I'm just taking way too much delight in your Twitter feed nowadays. Um, but, but the other being that you have recently written a book on one of the internet's favorite topics, and this is felines. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell everyone, how is it that a regular everyday physicist managed to take a passion for cats and turn it into what I hope will become a scientific bestseller. <laughs> yeah, um, to some extent, it was kind of luck because I blog a lot about the history of science and uh -huh. I tend to just wander through old journals looking for interesting papers. And I found this old paper from 1894, which was the first high-speed photographs of how a cat lands on its feet when it falls. And I wrote a blog post about that, but I wasn't quite sure I had the whole story. So I started looking at more papers and I just kept finding more scientific papers on the subject. Searching from literally 300 years ago up until pretty much the present day. And wow. when I had a publisher talk to me and say, hey, what do you want to do? I'm like, how about a book about how cats land on their feet? And my computer just moved sideways because I have a cat laying in a bed next to my laptop and she just knocked it sideways. So yeah, we're used to to pet earthquakes around here. I yeah. I am a dog person. I hope you will forgive me. I I have, I think, 150 pounds of Australian Shepherd in here right oh. now. It's spread across three dogs, so it's fine. <laughs> but uh, sometimes one will lean against the tripod and we'll get a... Uh, camera quake that is dog induced rather than tectonic induced so so you're a physics prof you're down in charlotte um and as a faculty member um do you do you get to teach classes where you get to bring up the physics of felines um i haven't had an opportunity yet because i've been basically teaching the kind of graduate optics courses at the moment. But I'm, I'm really trying. I would like to introduce a class where I sort of talk about physics from the context of the falling cat problem. Because in writing the book, for instance, I ended up, in order to explain some of the basics of falling cats, I had to kind of explain some of the basics of physics, momentum, energy, angular momentum without equations i should add i avoid those um and so i'd really love to turn this into a class where i just talk to people and show them cat videos and let them see for themselves how a cat does it and and i i put up the cover of your book for a moment but while the cover of your book is is a fabulously amusing um illustration my favorite of the ones that you sent me is this somewhat crazy looking schematic of um, two cylinders, one of which has a cat head and the other which has a cat hindquarters. And they have various arrows in various directions. Um, 
can can you take a stab at explaining this cat cylinder insanity? Yes. Um, and I should give credit to my friend and roommate, Sarah Addy, who's the artist who drew that picture for me because my artistic talent is not so good. Um, but it comes down to, and this was the problem back in 1894 that when speed photographs of a falling cat came out for a little while physicists were dumbfounded they actually could not explain it and the reason for this is because they had just figured out the idea of conservation of angular momentum and i always try and explain the conservation of angular momentum is basically a conservation of twisting and i'm in a twisty office chair right now so i can actually kind of do this if i twist my arms in one direction well, it's not that easy from this angle, but <laughs> if I twist my arms in one direction, my body tends to go the other way. And that's a conservation of angular momentum. So when physicists, before they had photographs, they were trying to explain how a cat flips over. They thought, well, a cat can't just flip over if it starts falling. It has to already be spinning. And then these photographs came out and showed, no, a cat starts falling without any motion whatsoever, and then boom just manages to flip over. And that freaked people out. And um, they, they fortunately came to their senses and gained courage really quickly. But what it, the, the kind of the main explanation these days is that that twist and counter twist, the way a cat does is it uses the two halves of its own body. That you need, if something rotates, you need something to counter rotate. And let's see if I can do this with my hands here. So if this is the front end of the cat, and this is the rear end of the cat. If it bends at the waist, now the two halves of the body can counter rotate. And now when it opens up, it's right side up. So we go from that, boom, twist, right side up. And that's what that two cylinder picture is trying to show is that a cat, which is a bendy object, they can use their own flexibility to help themselves turn over. And I have a picture in the book and I I think I sent it to you if you have it of my cat Cookie who's sitting right next to me right now who demonstrates rigidity of the feline form. Yeah, cats are very bendy. Cats are certainly both um they're a liquid and a solid. I I think that's really the best way to put it. So so uh there is cat in impossible angle on chair sh currently showing on the screen. <laughs> I recently got a video of her the other day. I took a video. I put some treats. She was laying in that position again. I put some treats in front of her and I expected her to sit up, but instead she kept herself twisted and just hoovered them up while laying there right next to him. And and this is a thing that critters will do. Now, I, I have to ask, did you at any point purposefully hold your cat up and drop? I have not. Um, I didn't drop any of my own cats. I've seen them fall off the things enough. To some extent, if you're a pet, if you're a cat parent, you tend to see them fall eventually anyway. Yes, this um, is true. But I also, I put a little disclaimer in the front of my book to say, hey, please don't drop your cats. Generally, I discourage it. There's plenty of videos on the internet. There are plenty of photos. I put pretty much every photographic sequence of falling cats I could find in the book. So there are a lot of, there are a lot of tests out there already. So there, there's certain things in science that when I hear about, it's just sort of like, how, how, how I, I've read some amazing papers on the dynamics of creamer mixing with coffee. I, I think multiple PhDs have been granted on this particular topic. And over the years, it seems like an unbroken chain of researchers have taken on the case of the falling cat and also the case of the falling toast with butter. Um, what are the some of the craziest examples that you found while looking through the research? Well, um, sort of the sort of the fields that people have become interested in falling cats include 
um, space, space travel. Um, once we started sending up people into weightless environments, NASA and other space organizations, including the uh, Soviet space organization, started doing research to understand how cats can flip over because they wanted to know if they had an astronaut in a weightless environment, they wanted their astronauts to be able to do that too. And there are really hilarious descriptions in, in the papers from the 60s of uh, engineers who figured out ways for astronauts to rotate around every axis of their body, including kind of my favorite is sort of the lariat. You put your arms up and you swing them around like that. And if you're in a weightless environment, if you swing your arms this way, your body's going to swing the other way. And even more strange contortions. But um, the cat problem became very, very important because a cat can do this in a fraction of a second where people usually struggle to turn around quite as quickly. And um, other areas, um, the problem is cropped up in geosciences. There are certain anomalous motions and wobbles of the earth that back in the 1890s, again, people were like, well, we don't really understand how this wobble of the earth is happening. And people turned to the falling cat problem to, to try and help explain it. No, and nowadays, we have robotic experts working on the problem as well. Yeah, robots definitely need to understand that. Um, so, so I've thrown up on the image with you the uh, historic image of someone holding a cat by its front and rear legs. People do not do this. Cats' legs aren't designed for that. And then dropping the cat and having it land on its feet. Can, can you walk folks through how this image was done and, and what is being shown? Yes. Um, so the image, that was the 1894 sequence that caused so much mischief in 1894. It was done by a French physiologist named Etienne Jules Marais. And he was very interested in the mechanics of living creatures. He really did view living creatures as machines that we could best understand how life works by treating it as basically a mechanical contrivance. And he built this huge institute in the 1880s and onward to study motion. And the cat ended up being one of the almost afterthoughts. Sort of a colleague of his said, well, you should photograph a falling cat. And um, Mary was one of the pioneers of high-speed photography. He actually got interested in it because of Edward James Moybridge, who most people know for the first high-speed photos of the galloping horse. Yes. And so what happens in those photos, well, this is where um, you can see a little bit of that cylinder problem in action. Um, the cat is dropped and for the, it goes from right to left, top to bottom, these images. Um, there was from the way we would normally think of it. I think that the one I sent you is that way yes. still. Um, and so the first three frames or so, you can see that the cat doesn't really seem to be moving at all. And this was what was shocking to the physicists of the era who assumed that the cat must push off of something to get itself turning when it starts to fall. And I believe it's somewhere about the, let's see, one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, the sixth image from the right is my favorite because that's sort of the clearest view of this sort of two-cylinder bend and twist motion that yeah. the cat is sort of bent sideways now with its face and its stomach facing you and that's sort of the beginning of that what's now called a bend and twist maneuver to flip over it turns out and this is the point of the book is that Part of the reason this problem has remained of interest and people have argued about it for, well, mostly a hundred something years, but really hundreds of years is that a cat probably uses multiple methods to turn over. And in physics, we often have an instinct to try and find a single explanation for yeah. things. 
Um, so I say that's not always the case, especially when you get into astrophysics and stuff, it's no longer that easy to say, well, this is just one thing. But a lot of us are trained with this sort of idea that, hey, this phenomenon is caused by this, this is caused by that. So we're always looking for the simplest solution where nature is always looking for the most effective solution and, is the way I like to put it. And I, I have to wonder how much of this is we're so used to educational systems where there's only one right answer. I Back when I was teaching physics in the past, there's multiple ways to solve a lot of mathematical problems. And I had students who, who lived in terror because they'd had past professors that if you didn't do it the exact most optimized way in that professor's opinion, wrong. But there are usually multiple ways to get from A to B through the mathematics. And there's also multiple ways to construct things. And we have convergent evolution that shows us that in biology, multiple ways can get to the same answer. And the fact that we've been so ingrained in physics and astronomy of no, there's one way. I feel like that's got to be holding us back as we look out across our universe and just trying to figure out how moons are made. It's it's appearing that moons are made many different ways. Right. And anyone who tries to come up with a single way of forming a solar system is wrong. And maybe yeah. we have something to learn from these cats. Yeah, uh, that's really a lot of what a, a, a big point of kind of the book is to say some problems are just more complicated and can't be described completely with a simple single pithy explanation. Now, usually you can, most problems we can still sort of say, okay, this is what we generally expect happens, or this is the main contribution, but the reality ends up being more complicated. I often use, um, airplane flying as an example that there's sort of this textbook example of well by using the Bernoulli force which is technically correct but it's also whoop there's a cattail um <laughs> in the screen um there whoop there went again you'll probably my screen will go in and out while she's flapping her tail in the on the on the webcam it's a pet um, friendly channel but there are also yeah <laughs> But there are um, that multiple sort of multiple effects that also contribute to flight in different ways. And so, you know, there's there's sort of the, the textbook answer that we give, but then if you're actually trying to design airplanes, you have to be aware of a lot more complexity. And we see, and we see this in a, in a lot of physics classes, in fact. We teach things, we teach a very simple explanation, and then later you're going to be taught, well, it doesn't completely work that way. And it's so frustrating. And then sometimes the physics just plain changes on you, which is completely unfair. And when when I was a grad student at UT Austin, um, one of my faculty, uh, Edward uh, Robinson, went by Rob. Um, he he said in class uh, offhand one day that the constants of physics don't seem to change, but you have to watch out for the equations. <laughs> that's very true that somehow reminds me of my phd advisor my late phd advisor there's a subject in optics called radiometry which is a way of sort of charting the flow of energy through um systems and it's it's more sophisticated than sort of the ray picture you often see where people draw lines because yeah. radiometry takes into account the actual flow of energy and it's a very successful field. It's very well used, but the foundations are are not so sound. And my PhD advisor used to teach a course on radiometry, and he'd hold up a book on the subject, and he'd say, I, "This book is beautiful. I have no problems with it, except for the first equation." That was sort of an example of. Yeah, sometimes we work with things, they work really well, but we don't know when the fundamentals are going to, to switch up on us a bit. 
Now, a, a lot of, of physics and astronomy is trying to figure out what variables actually matter. <laughs> now, with cats, were there any particular variables that determined what techniques they would use to fall, or was it simply a matter of where they were in the fall? For instance, would a Maine coon with no tail take a different approach to that overly long-tailed Siamese? Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, that's something else I try and stress the book a bit is probably part of the reason that uh, physicists fought so much about the explanation is that every cat is a little different. And so every cat probably is going to stress the, the fundamentals a little bit differently. Well, now we're getting a cat playing in the background. Um, <laughs> So every cat is going to um, do things a little differently because, yeah, um, cats will often use their tails to help them rotate. But if they don't have a tail, they can flip over just fine. So they can adjust. And if you have a larger cat, a short, a stouter, rounder cat, they're probably going to have a slightly different approach than a cat that's, um, you know, long and thin. And so... I've also described it that a lot of people looking at um, videos and photographs of falling cats, it often probably works as a bit of a Rorschach test for them, that they've already got something they're looking for in the photos, and they can probably find it um, in them. And if they can't find it with one cat, they can find it with another cat. If you take enough data, some of it will match your theory. Exactly. Oh, man. I, I now want to, like, I don't want to fill out the paperwork or do this research myself because, oh, my goodness, the paperwork. But can you imagine the study of chunky cat versus skinny cat? <laughs> yep. <laughs> and, and cats here in in the, the image, and I'll bring it up once again, um, of, of the stop motion falling cat. Um, the cat is just preparing to land as it hits the ground. So this is a cat that had exactly enough time to right itself. I, there are stories out there of cats falling great distances. I, I know, um, I've heard one of a cat that decided to get itself involved in a glider cabin accident and got dumped out a glider window and survived. Um, oh, cats, how do they know when to do the critical velocity flare versus just, okay, ground's right here? Yeah, um, that's a very good question. And that was, to some extent, also a big part of the early research in the 1930s and 20s, because um, once sort of the physicists got initially bored with understanding the mechanics of how a cat turns over, um, neurophysiologists started asking, well, how does a cat know when to flip over? And how does its, how does its brain and nervous system react? And one of the interesting challenges there is that they would actually blindfold cats and drop them. And the cat nevertheless could still land perfectly on its feet. And they, this was a curious challenge because they, at that same time, Einstein's um, general theory of relativity had come out. And so people were aware of the fact that an object in free fall is weightless. Yeah. So they were starting, so, so the physicists and the physiologists, to their credit, were kind of aware of this we're saying, well, wait a minute, how can a cat, if it can't see the ground and it can't, and it its other physical senses can't detect which way is up, how does it still know which way to go to land and to prep properly? Right. Is there an answer? We need to know if there is an answer. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, there's a bit of an answer. And a bit of the answer is, is that somehow the cat's, um, center system of balance actually retains a bit of memory that um, people did experiments with animals kind of 
um, there's a great series of experiments which are also talked about in the book where they subjected cats, in this case, actually rabbits, which have the same reflex. They subjected <laughs> rabbits to accelerations in cars and in ramps to try and throw off their sense of which way the direction of gravity was. Uh -huh. And then they then they drop them and say, okay, which way does the cat try and land or the rabbit? And they found that the cat or rabbit has about a five to six seconds of of memory that it keeps this sort of recollection of which way gravity was pulling it or it started falling for about five or six seconds. So if you keep it accelerating in a strange direction for more time than that, then you can get it to fall in a different direction. That would be awkward and devastating. Um, <laughs> it's, it's amazing what we can learn from the animal world because our brains instinctually do a whole lot of physics that it has taken scientists hundreds of years to sort all the mathematics for. We automatically can tell how far away something is by changes in angular size, by changes in brightness, if we know the actual size or brightness of an object or luminosity of an object. Um, this prevents us from getting hit by motorcycles that we just see the headlight. We know how far away that sucker is. Now, cats, mm -hmm. rabbits, automatically seem to have this self-correction for gravity. Are there any engineers out there who've been like, I can build this and have tried to make self-writing robots is what you'd mentioned earlier that take this same memory and orientation tact um well as i understand it at the moment they're trying but they haven't necessarily gotten it right yet um because it, it turns out it's a very complicated problem with a lot of variables that when a cat falls, it could be falling from a, or a robot could be falling from a certain height. It could already be rotating initially by, by the way it fell. It could be rotating in different directions or at different angles to start. And so there's been a lot of success of researchers making robots that in a controlled environment can sort of mimic the 180 degree flip to land on their feet. but is from what I've seen, it seems like an open problem to design a robot that can adjust to land on its feet from any, any starting condition, which is what they're really interested in. In the chat, uh, Larry is making the comment, I'm sure Boston Dynamics is on it and it's just classified. <laughs> it could very well be. Uh, I had to give mention to Boston Dynamics in the book for that because yeah, they've made incredible strides in this sort of work. Um, and we've come a long way. And a lot, of, a lot of the reason we've come a long way with robotics is by making robots more like animals. Um, and that's a lot of what I actually talk about in the robotics chapter of the book as well. As I mentioned, sort of, there's this natural evolution from the cat studies in the 20s and 30s where people were trying to figure out how the nervous system works up into the robotics research from the 1990s onwards where people realized that the best way to build a robot was to try and make it act and look and behave as much like an animal as possible. Yes. And Boston Dynamics has gotten slightly terrifying with some of their um, herd mechanics with those dog and cheetah shaped rovers not rovers robots that work together it's yeah amazing and awesome and um broken symmetry comments animal robot overlords yeah i think that the cylons will not be bipeds the cylons will not be bipeds yep now it, your research is completely not related to the physics of cats yeah <laughs> so uh, can you just to give our audience a, a sense of what what is the day to day life of of your research? Well, my work is in 
what we would call theoretical classical optics. So the theory part means that I mainly do pen and paper work and computer work. Uh -huh. um, and the classical optics part means that I study uh, light as a wave. I study the wave properties of light, which we've known about for over 200 years, but there's still so many surprises and interesting things we can do with that. And so a lot of what my workday involves is trying to study the equations that describe the behavior of light and trying to learn what what new and interesting and practical effects we can get out of those equations and to see what we've missed, what sort of a phenomena we've missed in those equations over the years. And it's sort of surprising. I like to say that um, it's one thing to, to have a set of equations that describe a phenomenon. We've had Maxwell's equations that describe the motion and the behavior of light for 150, 160 years now, but it's quite another thing to really understand what those equations tell you. And there have been some amazing breakthroughs in what you can do with light in the past 15 years. Um, my favorite is optical tweezers. Oh yeah. Uh, do you wanna explain it to our audience? Yeah. Um, well, a little bit about an optical tweezer is we know that light carries momentum, that light is moving, it carries energy, it carries momentum, so light has a kick to it. Um, it's a very small kick, which is why when you go outside in the morning in the sun, you don't get knocked backwards or anything. But it's, it's enough of a kick that you can actually move microscopic particles with a beam of light. And what was discovered in the 1980s was that, well, first in the 1970s, people realized that they could trap a microscopic particle between two beams of light. Yeah. So you sort of pinch it between two. And then in the 1980s, people realized that if you focus a beam of light and you have a really sharp focus, so you're really making the light come in and instead of coming in at a, a narrow angle, you have it come in at an extreme angle that the interaction between the light wave and the particle is such that the particle will just get trapped by that single beam of light. So you can use that beam of light to basically grab the particle, move it around, rotate it. So it's a non-contact way of grabbing and manipulating microscopic particles. And so I, this is where I have to admit, I am purely an observationalist, experimental kind of person, other than when I'm writing software. I also write a lot of software. Uh, but one of my first jobs was uh, running the educational labs at, at Harvard, because um, every astronomer must, at some point in their career, be somewhere in Cambridge. <laughs> and when all of the cool papers were coming out, the thought started to percolate around the faculty, how can we turn this into an introductory lab assignment? Oh. And so one of the cool things that I got to do when green lasers became a thing, be careful <laughs> with green lasers, people, act safely, um, is, is you can take just like a handheld green laser, and first of all, you can etch your name in chocolate. This is why you need to be careful with green lasers. <laughs> But you can spread the beam, beam out with just the right co combination of lenses to get a nice meaty laser beam. And then right before it gets to a solution that has either latex particles in it or very angry amoeba, <laughs> you can focus it down with a uh, little tiny, highly curved lens. And by taking a chunky laser beam and focusing it to a point, you can then, we were moving around our solution instead of the laser beam because that was easier, but you can grab something and put it where you want it. And this is how you start looking at like microscopic construction is you either carve things up with light or you move them around with light. And so it's light beams all the way down in the future. Yeah. So so what are, what are some of your favorites? things that you've found. Sorry, I 
always have to talk about laser tweezers if I can talk about laser tweezers. <laughs> no, it's a good subject. It's it's related to um, a big area of my research, which is nowadays called singular optics, but it's really about putting vortices in light. Now you can make a light beam that has a twist to it as it propagates, and um, it has basically a phase twist. So how? Um, there I'd probably need some pictures, but one way to think about it is if you make an optical element that acts like, that looks basically like a spiral ramp or a spiral staircase, then that ramp has a handedness to it. Mm -hmm. And then when you shine a light beam through that ramp, that light beam ends up picking up that handedness because the beam going through the thicker part is moving slower than the beam going through the thinner part. Yeah. So you can give a, you can give a twist to a light beam and a lot of people are very have been working very hard on applications for these light beams with a twist and this is a good example of one of those things that was basically unknown for a hundred years that from the 1860s when Maxwell did his wave equations up until the 1970s nobody really appreciated you could do this with a beam of light and then in the 1970s, a colleague of mine, Michael Berry, and his, uh, his associate, John Nye, they pointed out that you could have these phenomena. And since about the 1990s, it's turned into this major subfield of optics. And one of the reasons I mention it is because when you make a beam that has this sort of twist built into it, it has angular momentum, like yeah. the angular momentum talking with cats earlier and that means that you can not only trap particles with one of these beams with a twist you can make them spin around oh and people have made really cool micro machines by basically taking a bunch of these vortex beams and arranging them in such a way that they spin things to make little machines that's and... fabulous and horrifying <laughs> That is, it's really cool to see one of the earliest ones I saw was from 2004. People made a basically a fluid pump because they trapped a bunch of particles in a vortex beam and they had the vortices spinning in opposite directions. Oh. And those particles were then pushing the fluid and causing the fluid to flow through the center. So they were able to make a light driven, they called it a micro opto mechanical pump. That's cool. And and Hanny in the chat is asking, are there machines that can sort light with different levels of twisting? Can you like find the twistiest of twisty light? As a matter of fact, you can. And there are, um, when people work with these um, vortex beams, usually we talk about these vortices come with a distinct twist to them. Mm-hmm. Um, actually an integer twist. You can have a twist one, twist two, twist zero, twist minus one, minus two. In principle, all the way to plus or minus infinity, but we can never even get close to that. Yeah. But you can design optical elements that can take a beam that consists of multiple components with different twists and separate out all those twists or recombine them. And people are using that for um, optical communications now because we ta we typically tend to communicate th through multiple channels by using different frequencies. Right. Kind of like on you know your radio stations, you have your kilohertz and megahertz bands. You different yeah. channels are different frequencies. But now people who are trying to do light communication have realized, hey, we can use different twists to send information in the same light beam simultaneously and separate it all out in the end. That, so different optical things are easier and harder to do with different wavelengths of light. Like gamma rays, they just don't want you to do jack with them. <laughs> Where, whereas radio is like, split me up, recombine me, do it in a physical interferometer, I'm good. Radio is, is easy to work with. Now, yeah. for the kind of stuff that you're doing, what wavelengths are the most reasonable, if you were to do this in the real world, what wavelengths would you want to be working in? Um, well, most people who are working with um, optical vortices, as we call them, visible light, we 
the technology is good enough now where we can design optical systems that can make these beams, sort them and combine them. There are actually a bunch of different ways of making vortex beams and measuring them now. So researchers have this whole toolbox to work with, depending on what they've got lying around the lab usually. Yeah. Um, though it's interesting that you can do, um, you can actually do vortices even up to the X-ray range. There are people that yeah. have been, and I, I forget exactly how they make the vortex beams, but they're working at these sort of advanced photon sources, yeah. the synchrotrons for generating X-rays, and they're able to make elements that can give a twist to X-ray beams. And there, the goal is, is there the idea is, is if you make a beam, if you make an X-ray, we like to use X-rays to measure, say, crystal structures yeah. or virus structures or things that we really can't use visible light to measure. But if you have an X-ray beam that already has a twist to it, it is now more sensitive to detecting structures that also have a twist. And so a lot, there's a lot of interest in saying, hey, we can, let's make these twisted X-ray beams because now it'll probably be easier to measure things with a twist that we've had a hard time detecting before. That's wild. Um, I, I am looking forward to the future when communications doesn't need to use as many different wavelengths because instead of spreading out across the frequency bands, they're spreading out across the rotational options. It's, it's going to be decades, decades, decades <laughs> off. But this is a cool future to imagine. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of optimism. Um, there's been a lot of arguments as well, but there's a lot of optimism and a lot of active research in making the technology you know, cost effective and reliable and scalable. And it's it's gone it's changed dramatically in the past 20 years. And in fact, I like to boast too, I wrote a, a technical textbook on the subject that came out in 2016, which so far is pretty much the only comprehensible comp comprehensive textbook on the subject. I hope it's there. comprehensible as well. I hope so too, but <laughs> I leave that to others to decide, I guess. <laughs> This this is all amazing. Unfortunately, time is short. And I know I have a video conference I need to prepare for in 20 minutes. <laughs> um, so where all can people find your content? And I'm going to once again, put up the photo of the cover of your book and feel free to brag about all the awesome places that people should go to get your book into their brain. I, online retailers, um, you can probably order it from any of your independent bookstores at this point. Is there an audio version yet? I was just going to say there is an audible version that you can get. Excellent. And there is also an ebook version. And in the near future, there should be a few translations as well. So this this is amazing and after watching you talk about writing this for so many years it's absolutely amazing to finally see this come to fruition and and where can people follow your blog and find you on twitter well my blog is called skulls in the stars and if you go to skullsinthestars.com you'll find my blog there i blog about science travel, Dungeons and Dragons, whatever I happens to hit me for the day. And my Twitter is Dr. Sky Skull, which is a play on my blog name, which the Dr. Sky Skull was a friend of mine once mockingly called me that and then I kind of liked it and turned it into a thing. You know, you know, all of our names have a history and they don't all make sense except to us. And that's okay. Yep. So this has been absolutely amazing, and we will need to have you back next time there is something breaking in either your science or your writing. Um, Sounds good. This is just fun. So I'm going to let you escape, and I'm going to round out this episode by uh, 
going over, well, the credits. Um, I say thank you, and I hope to talk again soon. It's thank you so much, Greg, and good luck getting through these crazy times we're in. And um, may the cat amuse your students as much as it amuses all of us. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> all right. Thanks. Thank you for being here. It's been a pleasure. Yep. And I'll see you on the internets. Yep. All right. Bye. <laughs> bye bye. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for sticking around for this super long special episode. And um, I will be back tomorrow to bring you more science and bring you coffee and probably a combination thereof. Um, I don't think we have any more streams planned for today. Things have gotten somewhat slow in the land of, well, rocket launches. Well, in the land of everything, let's face it. But we're going to do what we can to fill in and bring you as much to keep you busy as we can. So tomorrow at 9.30 a.m. Central, 10.30 Eastern, 7.30 Pacific, uh, we are going to be bringing you the um, morning coffee where I'm going to review all that is new, all that is going on, and give you a scientific start to your day or start to your evening, depending on where in the world you may be. But for now... This has been The Daily Space, right here live on twitch.tv slash CosmoQuestX. If you ever miss an episode, you can check them out over on YouTube. And we also have a podcast you can get wherever you find podcasts. My name is Dr. Pamela Gay, and I was the author of today's episode. And this episode will be produced by the ever amazing Susie Murph. This is a product of the Planetary Science Institute, a 501c3 nonprofit dedicated to exploring our solar system and beyond. We are here thanks to you. Your bits, your subs, your donations at patreon.com slash CosmoQuestX and all the volunteer efforts you do, they allow us to do everything we do. So thank you so much for being here and thank you for supporting us. And if you aren't already supporting us, well, check us out at CosmoQuestX.org and find out how you can get involved and how you can support us through donations. Really, we need you to keep doing what we do. And together, we're going to explore our universe. So that's it. Wherever you are in the world, thank you so much, AstroWise. Thank you. Um, wherever you are in the world, have a fabulous morning, evening, or afternoon. And wash your hands. <laughs> Bye-bye, everyone.